Welcome to the Valley Advocate Podcast, featuring interviews that take us deeper into the people and happenings on the local scene. For more podcasts and a closer look at what's going on in the Valley, visit us at valleyadvocate.com. Hi, my name is Dave Eisenstatter. I am the editor of the Valley Advocate, and this is the Valley Advocate Podcast, our collaboration with Amherst Media. I'm here with arts and culture editor Gina Beavers. And we are here with uh, Springfield attorney Tahira Amatul Wadud, who is running against Congressman Richard Neal in the upcoming primaries. Yes. Yes. Welcome. Thank yeah, you. Welcome. Thank you both for having me. Oh, glad to have it's you. Great to glad to have you. You're a big deal. <laughs> well, the people are the big deal. I just <laughs> become the face of the people. That's yeah. You you That's had cool. to, you had something that just came out today about um, that is kind of just like cuts to like the very heart of mm-hmm. everything mm-hmm. Um, about this uh, this congressional race is that people I think you had said that they had criticized you know whether if you got elected they'd lose all that seniority right. from Congressman Neal uh, being in place uh, in place so long but you said that that really wasn't a problem because. That's right. Um, so in the camp during the campaign and on the trail. Some of the more critical comments came from people who knew enough to realize that one, he was on the Ways and Means and that he was a member and that if the House turns blue and he is still in office, then he stands to be the chair of Ways and Means. So people who knew that and were able to frame it that way would ask me, how do you respond to that? So um, it was pretty simple to me, but I needed to convey it to the people which is essentially that ways and means is very important, but that if the congressman becomes unavailable for any reason, unavailable, unwilling, doesn't get reelected, life goes on. Mm. In the first instance, life goes on. But let's talk about ways and means and what the role does. It's responsible for allocating funds. He's been on the committee since 2017, and our community has yet to realize any benefit from his status on that committee. Additionally, he has um, taken lots and lots of money and funds from corporations and special interest groups, which, according to our research, cuts uh, and undercuts the needs of the people and the constituents. So when you look at the level of non, um, sort of, sort of the, the lack of production that he's had for the people, already in that seat and what that looks like if he becomes the chair it's it looks pretty grim Mm. additionally our community really is suffering we have the lowest median income of all of the nine congressional districts in the commonwealth of massachusetts we have higher than average unemployment we have higher than average number of citizens who are not covered on health insurance if you are in that role as ways and means, you would expect that your district would meet these different benchmarks of success and prosperity that are failing. And I'm concerned that as chair, we would continue to suffer and continue to fail. Mm. Yeah, and and that's the first congressional district. That's um, Springfield area and uh, Berkshire County and then some of um, a few other counties, Hampshire and and, uh, Franklin and Worcester counties. You got it. It's all of Hamden County, Mm -hmm. all of all of Berkshire County, part of Hampshire, part of Franklin, and a few towns in Worcester County. You got it, it's 3,000 square miles. And when you look at the map, it's kind of shaped like an L, mm-hmm. neighboring um, Congressional District 2, which is, of course, uh, Representative McGovern's seat. Yeah. Um, and I guess, um, you know, as like a, a new person coming in, you know, do you see that as being an advantage too? I mean, uh, you know, you're, you're losing one thing or you might lose some seniority. Like what can a new person bring to Congress that's kind of based, you know, based on seniority, I yeah. guess? I would suggest that the seniority, that if, if we really look at it, the seniority is inconsequential or could hurt us mm. if the wrong person wields the power. So number one, if the congressman is not sitting and the house turns blue who's gonna come up next who's in line for succession john lewis Mm. civil rights icon right okay lloyd doggett of texas so from a national perspective the country and the democratic party uh stands to benefit from that sort of a leadership because we know what john lewis does and what he stands for in the first district the community benefits from me at the helm 
serving the citizenry and putting their needs first. So what do we get in a new representative? We get somebody who listens. I'm already spending lots and lots of hours and time on the road listening to the constituents, reading and amplifying the needs of this community, and I'm not getting a paycheck. Mm -hmm. That's what our community deserves, and that's what they'll see from me as their congresswoman in Washington. So when you talk to constituents, when you talk to the people in, in uh, every day, what do you hear? Oh, I hear now that the race is on and it's vibrant and it's yeah. alive, I'm hearing lots of enthusiasm, lots of excitement, lots of collateral positive impact, um, lots of engagement with people feeling like I can do that too, I can help, I make a difference. It matters, representation matters. These are the things that I'm hearing that you could not necessarily anticipate the impact uh, of, of running would have right. on the community. So we're already winning in that people feel alive right. and excited about it. Because I, wouldn't, I don't think anybody would argue that over the course of the last nine years in Congress, there's been such stalemate, such, um, people running, becoming establishment politicians, people who aren't invested in making so much of a change right. as just staying and depending and relying on people to keep them in that office. Right. And it's people like you who are saying, hey, this is, and it really does seem like a new day. It does. It does seem like a new day with, with all the social movement that's happening. This and people is true. realizing that they're, they're really tired. This but you, is true. But I, you almost wonder, kind of speaking like that, uh, like why you would want to go into Washington <laughs> right. after nine years, like you're talking about, of, yeah. of deadlock. And even before that, kind of a lot of stuff that um, wasn't really great going on. Yeah, it's, it's necessary. I have seven children. The youngest is four. The oldest is 24. Wow. My parents are hitting retirement age. And when I look at my parents' future and my children's longer futures, I realize that unless I roll up my sleeves and play an active role in how we shape it from a policy perspective, things look really dim for mm -hmm. them. And if it looks dim for them, the children of a lawyer, and my husband's a hardworking uh, employee at a nonprofit, if things look dim for the future of my children, then they look even dimmer for the children of this district, unless they have representation that truly understands and values the people. So I look at this as an opportunity to serve our citizenry in a way that lets them know they have a champion with her finger on the pulse of the needs of this community. And coming in with a fresh face and a fresh start, and hopefully we do have a blue wave, and hopefully mm -hmm. there is a, a new incoming class full of women with great progressive ideas, then we can get to Washington, D.C., and then we can impact change. We're not uh, coming in beholden or saddled with uh, debts that we owe or favors that we owe. We're able to really sit and talk about the issues and try to advance policies that matter. And that's what I'm looking to be a part of. I don't see myself sitting in that seat in 29 years. Mm -hmm. No, I have a job to do. <laughs> My job is to get, shape policy, get it, get our future where it needs to be, and then go to do something else. Yeah, go back right. to practice in law. But this is not going to be a career. It is a commitment. Mm -hmm. It will be impactful. And then we'll hand the future over to the next generation that's ready hmm. to keep going. That's how I see. That's how I see things. I can honestly say I've never heard a politi anybody who's seeking a political office say that. Yeah. <laughs> it, yeah. Ever. Yeah. yeah. Um, I. You know. I think one of the one of the like real like uh, fights going on now in like in the Democratic Party. I wonder if you'd you know share your thoughts on is there was the um, what's called the Bernie Sanders wing and then mm -hmm. what's called the establishment wing. And there, you know, there's a lot of talk about what that's going to mean for 2018 and 2020, and whether that means that uh, Nancy Pelosi might have to step down as the speaker. And I just wonder, kind of looking at that whole swirl of issues, what your thoughts are. There's so much to get bogged down in when you look about look at the Democratic Party. Mm. And what do I tell people? I was a kid when it started going downhill when they f failed to have a succession plan and bring in uh, diverse people and ideas mm. and fund uh, students in high school and Democratic committees in high school and, high, and college like the Republicans did. The Republicans were right. really good about yeah. structuring the Republican Party and meanwhile the Democratic Party didn't do that and mm -hmm. that's why we've been sort of outplayed and I can't take credit for that because you know 
I wasn't there. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not establishment. That said, I feel that there's a major strength in the Democratic Party, particularly when you look at the progressive um, candidates and elected officials that are coming in, because those ideas tend to be more people focused and people centered. And I really don't like labels. Even in my, the practice of law, when my clients come in and they say, I want full custody or I want this, tell me, let's move the label. Tell me really what the characteristics are that you want and let's try mm. to achieve them. And I see the same thing even in when we run for office when people want to say, are you more Bernie? Are you more Hillary? No, nah, let's look at the policies and let's develop them for what they are and let's not just jump on to language that just sounds easy and sexy and hashtaggy at the time. So I think we're going to see sort of um, a combination of, of policies, whether they're Bernie policies or Hillary policies, but I really believe that we're going to lead more so with the policies that serve people and put people first. Mm -hmm. And label that the way you want, but that's where I see it going, and that's what I think the American people want and particularly the people of the 1st Congressional District here in mm. Massachusetts. And do you support Nancy Pelosi? Um, I, I support a strong Democratic Party and whatever it takes to make it strong and to give it credibility right. so long as the Democratic Party recognizes and sees the need to improve, to bring in inclusivity, mm and to uh, advance ideas and policies that the people want. This is not the time to be tone deaf mm -hmm. or to turn a blind eye. And unless the Democratic Party does that, then we're gonna keep losing. Yes. You're gonna lose. Agreed, yeah. agreed. It's hard to determine what the, who the Democratic Party is right That's now. That's right. Mm -hmm. Something the Repu Republicans struggled with for such a period of time, and now the shoe's on the other foot. That's true, Yeah. that's true. So you get out there and, you, you align yourself with people whose ideas match yours and or whose ideas may not match yours but feel like something you can get on uh, the same page with and help to develop. And that's where I see us going from 2018 onward. Mm -hmm. um, a lot, I mean, a lot of people kind of describe your candidacy as uh, kind of an uphill, uphill battle against an entrenched uh, politician. How's it going? You know, you've been you've been at it for a few months now. Um, you know, uh, how how do you feel like people are receiving you? And, and kind of can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah, we've been at it since December nineteenth. Today <laughs> is your, birth, your birthday, right? My birthday. Yes, right. And we're already winning. And what does that mean? People like this race. People like talking about the year of the woman. You know, you just did a story on it. It's the current issue. Um, it's the thing people are talking about nationally. So anytime. I get a microphone where people want to say, well, what was the impact of Donald Trump's election into your decision to run? Or what is it like to be a, a black woman who's running for office? I Because it's the thing to talk about now, we get a lot of media attention around that. But I take the microphone, and I don't want to talk about me. I know about me. I want to talk about us. I want to take the microphone and talk about the people of the first congressional district. I want to talk about their goals for having jobs, economic prosperity, access to affordable health care and internet, and the feeling of being involved in their gov government in a, in a meaningful way. And so, for the first time in forever, those issues are making news because I'm talking about them. So we're already winning. We're already amplifying the voice of many people who feel marginalized. And that feels great. Mm -hmm. It feels mm. great. Yeah, what, I guess what, you know, what do you feel like really are the most important issues? I mean, you, you mentioned like healthcare and internet and stuff like that. Like what, like what are, what are they communicating to you? What are the people who you are meeting communicating to you? Um, the most uh, applauded issue Medicare for all. Mm -hmm. People love that. People want it. I was in a meeting recently with healthcare professionals, and uh, one of the providers said, I don't want to be over regulated. It'll tie me down in paperwork and bureaucracy. And I said to him, Well, we're going that way. So now is your opportunity to get involved in helping to shape what that policy looks like. But this is what the people want, and it's going to come. It's mm -hmm. going to come. It's not if it's about when. And when I talk about that, regardless of where I am in the district, people applaud. So we are going that way towards the Medicare for All 
option. That's what people like. Um, every family also, it, it resonates with every family, the idea of dealing with addiction. Mm. That is very important. No one has the answer. Um, uh, it's a devastating issue to talk about. It's often very private. But when I say this is something we need to deal with, I'm not just saying let's talk about addiction and let's throw money at it. I'm saying we have to talk about the disparity in addiction and right. how white folks handle addiction and are treated with addiction issues one way and right. black and brown people are treated with addiction issues another way. Mm -hmm. And that tends to be a more punitive way. Yep. But what we need to do is have a heart to heart talk about about why there's the disparity. And that's that that comes from a racial and social economic um, divide. Deal with it that way then go towards a clinical and compassionate approach and move away from the punitive mm -hmm. models mm -hmm. and that of course gets into the issues of criminal justice, justice reform right. exactly and that's what we need to do so this district is about 83 percent to 88 percent white and so for me to go out into the community and say this is how we solve this problem is the first time a lot of people are hearing it addressed that way but guess what it works because if we dealt with the crack addiction mm. with a model the way I just framed it, then we wouldn't suffer from the opioid addiction right. the way it is, or and we wouldn't suffer in the first instance. And if we were suffering, we'd have a, an answer. So we have to step back and deal with that. Additionally, um, and to talk about the opioid crisis, I mean, we have issues around policy and why we're not benefiting from good, pharma, uh, from good policy around pharmaceutical use. But also, my opponent takes lots of corporate donations and contributions from big pharmaceutical mm -hmm, companies, mm -hmm. which I would not do, which would leave me free to sit down and have um, a meaningful approach to crafting policy that deals with all aspects of how, of, of how medications and, and drug use uh, is dealt with, which is what our people need. Right. It, it's not a secret. It's what we need. Um, you're going to be, I think, I'm not sure exactly what the deadline is, but I know you're going to be filing a report soon saying how much money you have. So, I mean, you're not accepting money from that source. Do you have any money? I mean, do you have anything in the bank? We like, what, are what? raising money. Um, my treasurer is still crunching the numbers. This is not a conventional campaign. Right. And the people who are funding it are the people. And when we look at the conditions of the people, we've already said we have the lowest median income, higher mm -hmm. than average. So these are people who are donating $25, and it comes at sacrifice in their budget. And that's because they believe that I am the representative who will speak for them and help to change the course of things for them and their quality of life. So am I going to report that I'm making millions of dollars? Absolutely not. <laughs> but <laughs> Wasn't <we're>, what I expected. <laughs> <laughs> but we are raising enough to meet the needs that we that we have and to keep the, the campaign strong and vibrant and to bring in the staff and the talent that we need. Mm -hmm. And nothing about this is conventional, but conventional has failed us. Mm. So I apologize for nothing with respect to how uh, how we're how we're doing from an economic standpoint, because that's a measuring stick that does not apply to us or to the people. Um, oh, I'm sorry. What were you no, saying? no, 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 nothing. Oh, it. okay. I just, well, I'm curious. Like, I, um, you know, we just did the story about the year of the woman, and um, I and a lot of the um, the women that are running for lower offices are, you know in towns that, that, that you're running oh, to represent yeah. as well. And I'm just wondering what kind of connections you're making with, with those women. I understand that you know a bunch of them already. I know all of oh, them. Oh, you know all of them? I know all of them. And um, it's been wonderful to be a part of this movement. I don't know if we've ever had this before in Western Massachusetts, but it's wonderful for me to send them an email or a message or a post and say, you go, you keep going, I'm proud of you. Because what is it doing? It's giving the constituents options. It's letting people know what the issues are from the perspective of the candidate who mm -hmm. seeks to serve them. And I'm excited at the idea of becoming the Congresswoman for the first congressional district and the ripe choice that our constituents have and who represents them on the state side. Like, it's the best of both worlds mm -hmm. for me. It is, it is absolutely wonderful. You know, I just want to ask from a from a black female perspective. Um, you said you gave a very interesting number. Eighty three percent of this district is white. 
and it's really flipped around in Springfield. Yes. It's that community, Holyoke yes. Springfield, where it's really flipped on its head. Yes. So what, when you go out, what's the difference that you feel, if if you will, when you go to say, um, gosh, Spencer? Mm-hmm. Is Spencer part of? I don't know. And Worcester County, I, parts of Worcester County, yeah. not Spencer. Okay, so you go to a predominantly white um, town, so like Shelburne Falls, at Shelburne Falls, in in you know in the district, and you're in Springfield where you live. What's that difference? What's it feel like? What what is it that you your mess? I I would assume that your message never changes, but your per, the perception of you changes. Yeah. How do you navigate that? Uh, it is interesting. Um, that is a very interesting question. Um, and it's real that yeah. how my message does first my message does not change right. I deliver the same message uh, and might share anecdotes a little differently mm-hmm. depending on the audience so that it resonates with mm-hmm. them in the appropriate way what I always do is acknowledge that whether I'm in Shelburne Falls or whether I'm in Holyoke or Springfield or Wilbraham we all have the same sort of goals and the same concerns they manifest differently but they're the same Mm -hmm. and when I can deliver a message like that and and draw the parallels about people's life throughout the district I think that makes me much more of an effective and credible representative in my own campaign Um, as an African-American woman I've always navigated spaces right. that were predominantly white. That's mm-hmm. not a secret. I've gone to law school. Mm-hmm. I've gone to private college. My children um, have gone to prep schools. And just so some of our worlds have been um, where we've been the only ones like us. Mm-hmm. So I think I have a really good handle on understanding such a diverse population right. from my own existence and birth to the places that I've been purposefully placed in order to thrive, work, school, et cetera. And so I, I know how to connect, I know what the issues are, and I'm not afraid of, of difference and being different. And I'm not afraid of commonality and, and being the same and, and figuring out how to draw on those commonalities. Right. Yeah, Gina, you had a great um, uh, editorial recently about kind of connecting with, um, uh, what, what was the movie? Wrinkle in Time, uh, oh. kind of through that new movie, uh, like, uh, you know, just kind of connecting through, uh, you know, the different casting yeah. of having an African American yeah. woman like in that role. And I don't know. I mean, I kind of think that there might be some parallels to like a, a, a congressional candidate um, running. You know, people seeing differences and right. similarities. I mean, I don't know. I don't no, know I you agree feel with you. No, I agree with you wholeheartedly. It's about seeing yourself through a different lens, or or being able to see yourself in particular places. Mm. And I think. From that perspective, I'm glad that you know a person like you who's running um, in this in this district, in this predominantly white white district. There are girls that will be looking oh, to you, yes, and girls who might not have thought that I can be a political figure, or that you know, or even have the interest. Yes. Um, but now, young girls are so involved too in this whole in in Me Too, also in uh, March for Our Lives. This political groundswell, this grassroots groundswell that watching people like Emma Gonzalez, you know, um, be able to affect some kind of change in power that you've got, you're going to have girls who are going to really be looking and probably already Already. do. Already. Like they have a whole new, you know, vision on what they can do with their life. This is such a, this this is such a, um, a a pretty phenomenal time Mm. for women. So that that has happened to you? Oh, it already has. And as you know, the advocate had my picture on the front page. No. <laughs> <laughs> Were you in armor? I'm in armor. <laughs> and other newspapers have had my picture on the front page. So what's starting to happen is there's a normalization of a woman seeking a position of authority and power. A and Muslim influence. woman. A Muslim woman and one who is black. And so it's already happening. I went to my son's school the other day. They go to school right over the border. But a um, little fifth grade girl says to me, I saw you in the newspaper. Can you come to my lunch? Can you come to our school and talk to us at lunch? Mm-hmm. Because 
they feel mm. like I represent them. I remember being a little girl and watching the Olympics. Yeah. And they're very rarely being black athletes and that were gymnasts or ice skaters and being excited when they would come on because I felt like representation matters. Mm -hmm. So the world, the country is excited about the Olympics and there's a sense of national pride. Right. And I have someone who looks like me whose hair might look like mine. Or the ponytail might have been difficult to, to <laughs> manage and control just like mine. It matters. It impacts where you feel you belong in your society and in your country. Yeah. And this race is doing that in ways also. And, and, and it and it also, um, it speaks not just to black girls or to Muslim girls, but to all Absolutely. people. Everybody sees something in me or in my story that matters to them. And so when we talk about representation matters, you just never know what is going to do that, that thing that it does to your heart when you see her on the front page of the paper. Mm. Yeah. Ha have you experienced any um, Islamophobia through the campaign? Yeah, yeah. yeah. When, when strong women do strong work, um, there's always people that wanna derail them. That happens. Uh, I need that T-shirt. <laughs> when strong women do strong work. Right. That's right. You're like, expect derailment. That's right. right. The expect attempt. derailment. <laughs> yep. I told my team the other day, I said, what we need to do is we know what's going to happen. We know what people are going to say. We know what people are going to do. And we have to steal ourselves for that. Maybe we write it all out so that as it starts to happen, we don't feel like, oh, my goodness, that really shook us. No, we turned to, on April 1st, 2018, we predicted this, this, and that. Um, what do people say things on the internet or they approach me or they do things that are just that feel weird or threatening but that's okay because it means that I'm doing something right right otherwise nobody pay attention right right, right. wasn't like wasn't it recently I'm gonna say this all wrong but something like do harm to a Muslim day or yes, something like punish that a Muslim punish day. a Muslim day yeah yes. yeah April 3rd April yeah insane yes Mm. Yes, yes. Flatly insane. Yeah. It's real. It, it is real. It's real. It's real. Yeah. yeah. But it's okay. We're not going away. Yeah. No, you know. Well, but and, and through your <laughs> through your law work, you, you you know, you actually helped to um to, you know, put somebody away for um for hate crimes. Yes. Or, or, and you I think have done that multiple times, but there's one sort of high profile case maybe you could talk about. Yes. So some of my civil rights work that um that was some of the most fulfilling work that I've done was representing a community that had been the target of some pretty vile and violent threats. And while the Department of Justice had prosecuted the defendant who had um, made those threats to the Muslim community in New York, I represented along with a colleague of mine as interested victims, the community. Mm -hmm. So I got to be the liaison between the community and the Department of Justice. And that meant we observed the trial, we participated in the trial, and that was um, very interesting and it ended up being a successful prosecution of the man his name was Robert Doggart and it this, the trial took place in uh, the U.S. District Court for the Eastern District of Tennessee so we were traveling and we made sure that justice was served and the the premise of the case against him had to do with the fact that he had targeted a house of worship mm. and as the child born into a family of Christians when my parents converted to Islam when I was young um, it was very, very important to me to, to not only stand up for a house of worship that's a mosque, but to also speak out against the desecration of churches when my grandmother loved her church and the desecration of, of synagogues. Mm -hmm. And so from 2013 to 2015, particularly this country had noticed an uptick in all kind of anti-religious sentiment. And I was there among great people advocating for awareness and pressuring the Obama administration for a proper response. So mm -hmm. that was some of the work that, that I was very honored to do. Mm. Yeah, and you know, it just reminds me, I mean, horribly, and I mean, all of these um, events that uh, come from uh, gun violence, and um, you know, there's renewed talk, finally, about um, gun control, right. and I just wonder kind of, um, you know, where you see yourself in that debate and where you see Congress acting um, on that. I. When I listen to the voices of our youth and hear their cry for attention and for some sort of specific direction around gun control 
on a, a, on a universal level because in Massachusetts we have an attorney general who's been quite aggressive mm-hmm. with respect to gun policy. Um, my family, my husband, he owns firearms. I've trained to use a firearm because I was going to get my license to carry, which I haven't gotten yet. So I listen particularly critically around what policies we should have. In the first instance, I want to increase the age limit. We need universal background checks. You know what I do for a living as a family law attorney? I'm frequently dealing with cases that have aspects of domestic violence. Mm -hmm. So we need a registry that captures that people may, who who have a history of violence need to be vetted properly. Um, I'm less inclined to say let's ban assault weapons without defining what an assault weapon is and what types of weapons present the danger that we're looking to save the kids and our families from. Sometimes you have uh, accessories and characteristics of firearms that make them particularly dangerous, Mm -hmm. but they may not be called an assault weapon. Mm -hmm. So as a lawmaker and as a lawyer, I'm really careful to avoid the catchy phrases and to roll up my sleeves and look carefully at what type of policy achieves the goals that we are looking to achieve. Saving our kids and keeping them safe and more importantly, making them feel safe is our first and highest priority across all levels and making sure that we do it in a way that is um, uh, responsible is is the most effective way. So we're still working on what that policy will look like, but it's one of those, it's almost like a homework assignment that you're really excited to be able to do Mm -hmm. because you know that you can just do the greatest job ever because you already know in your mind what needs to happen. You just have to do the research and continue the listening tours to fill it all in. Mm-hmm. So we'll be working on that and hopefully we'll be able to issue a more complete statement. But I think it's going to include a more holistic look at what's happening in, in our country. It'll be much more than ban assault weapons because that just may not do the trick. Right. Hmm. right. Yeah. So where's the party going to be on uh, primary? Right. <laughs> <laughs> I have... I have an 11 year old girl and a 14 year old boy who are already putting together the band. Oh, nice. Yes. They are going to perform <laughs> That's violin, great. drum, guitar. Wow. So I don't know yet where. No, I'm dead yeah. serious. You know the, the music, you know what's happening. I already know. Yeah. So I've handed over the entertainment to the kids. <laughs> so. And what would your life look like if and when you win? What will your life look like? Yeah. It's going to change dramatically. It will change. Um, But my children, and I think about, because when I think about that question, I think first about my kids and my family and where I'd be. And of course, I'd be in D.C. for Mm -hmm. a significant part of it, back in the district for another part of it. Um, But my children are so good. They're so selfless that they saw their mother working full time while going to law school delivering a baby, breastfeeding a baby (laughs) while in law school and working full time Mm. because they knew that I was always working to provide them with a better life. And I have such a great support network. My husband's great, my parents are great, my brothers and sisters are great. And the children have learned how to rely on our family to help them. And they understand that this is important work and that once we win, they'll be able to hang out in DC and enjoy life that way. They'll be a part, and they are part of this historic moment and movement. And I'm I'm just not worried about it. I'm excited for them. I'm excited for them. I am too. Thank you. (laughs) I'm excited for all of our kids. I really, I really am. Yeah, well, to hear Amatul Wadud, thank you so much oh, for thank joining you us. so much. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Oh, our pleasure. <laughs> yeah. It was great. Thank you. Thanks for listening. And don't forget to visit us at valleyadvocate.com.